Chapter 28 About That Prologue Dorian King was once again standing at the window, looking down at the pre-rally below. From the moment Brad and Justine entered the CEO's office and sat down at the small conference table by the door, Dorian King hadn't once turned away from the window. Brad shifted and tried not to be too awkward while forcing himself to avoid Justine's intense, almost mocking gaze. If he wasn't so uncomfortable, Brad might have laughed as he recalled one of the most ridiculous rumors he had ever heard about the CEO. There had been wild speculation to explain Dorian King's aberrant, isolationist, and often unsettling behavior. Dorian King was some kind of eunuch having been castrated either physically or chemically for one conspiratorial reason or another. Brad's favorite reason, or at least the one that made Dorian King somewhat relatable, was that the man intentionally castrated himself to eliminate any potential offspring who might challenge his power and authority over vector defense. It removed all romantic interests, so that he could focus solely on business. The whole idea had been absurd, right up until Justine started thrusting her cock in Brad's face. Suddenly, the coincidence of a castrated executive employing a girl who sported all the functionality the CEO lacked, well, it didn't seem like that much of a coincidence anymore. Those two freaks of fucking nature deserved each other. Ms. Dillon is very impressed with Mr. Johnson's record, Justine said, flipping through pages in Brad's file. She's recommending he be passed over for the manager position in research and development. At first, Brad was too preoccupied with Dorian King's icy demeanor. Sir, I think the real-world field experience I can bring to management Justine's words finally sank in, and his head whipped around in shock. Wait, what? She's not recommending me since when? And what the hell am I doing here? Justine gave him a small, curt smile. Brad wanted to punch her in the face, but he didn't want to get her cock-sucking trans germs all over himself. The next time he saw Lorraine Dillon, he would straight up, The crowd is getting bigger, Dorian King said, his tone monotonous and flat as he stared down at the pre-rally tailgaters. Brad was mystified. What? Doesn't seem like it should be this big. It's Nicholas Green. If anything, it should be bigger. Nicholas Green always has the biggest crowds no matter where he goes. Brad said before shaking his head and holding up his hands. Look, I thought this was an interview. Do you think people are drinking down there? King asked no one in particular. Yes, sir, Justine replied. Alcohol? Primarily, yes. Seems early for that. Do you think they have enough? Alcohol? Brad couldn't believe his ears. I think their drinking preferences are probably the least of our concerns, Justine said. Until it becomes our singular concern. Justine straightened the papers in Brad's file. Sir, Ms. Dillon wanted to recommend Mr. Johnson for the R&D director position that's been frozen since Wilhelm went on medical leave. Brad really couldn't believe his ears. This was the first he was hearing about leapfrogging the manager position altogether. That must have been why Lorraine Dillon wanted the CEO to interview him. A promotion to manager could have easily been handled in the COO's office, but a new director would need the CEO's approval. Brad had already been pumped about the money that came with the manager title, but a director position was a whole new ballgame.
This changed absolutely everything. Fuck repairing the Challenger. He'd just buy a new one, along with finding a new apartment. Or, fuck it, buy one of those starter homes everyone gets an adulting boner over. And fuck Tess, right along with her dumb little lapdog, Richard. Brad could easily find another girl, one with far less baggage. After Tess left, Richard had been pulled into the COO's office alongside Chuck. Despite working as her personal executive assistant, Richard could count the number of times he had been in Lorraine Dillon's office on one hand. She treated the space as her sanctum, rarely allowing anything casual or informal to occur behind the door. As Lorraine explained it, her job was to make extremely complicated decisions, and she needed a calm space away from the pressure and chaos of those decisions. Like the CEO's office, Lorraine's office had an expansive, sprawling footprint. Unlike Dorian King's minimalist floor plan, Lorraine's space was both fully furnished and thoughtfully decorated. Large bookshelves lined an entire side of the office, reducing the overall perceived size of the office. Between the bookshelves was a floor-to-ceiling display case full of Lorraine's career achievements and awards, carefully arranged behind glass doors. The bookshelves, the display case shelves, the executive desk, the conference table, and even the arms of the chairs around the conference table were made from a rich, polished cherry wood that gave Lorraine's office an instant sense of warmth. This was strange because Richard felt a bizarre sense of unease as he sat inside Lorraine Dillon's office. While he had rarely penetrated Lorraine's special sanctum, this was undoubtedly the first time he did so without his dick. Now, his Ken doll smooth groin was tingling, leaving Richard with an uncomfortable feeling of needing to urinate. He stole a sideways glance at Chuck, who seemed unfazed to be inside the executive office of Vector Defense's second most powerful employee. Who did you deliver that letter to? Lorraine asked from behind a desk that was best described as organized chaos. Uh, the campaign has a temporary office trailer parked at the far end of the surface lot, Chuck explained. I walked the letter out, and inside the trailer, I put it directly in the hands of Nicholas Green's campaign manager, Cassidy McMasters. Chuck stood from the conference table and stepped over to Lorraine's desk. Richard marveled at how casually he conducted himself as if he didn't even know how rare it was for someone of his stature to be in her office. He handed her a piece of paper. It was a mailroom courier receipt that was date-stamped and signed by Chuck and Cassidy McMasters. Lorraine glanced over the receipt. Did you see or did Justine tell you what was in the letter? She asked without looking up from the paper. Chuck shook his head. Nope. I got my signatures and then hoofed it back to the mailroom for rounds. Couldn't even tell you if they opened it. Lorraine placed the receipt flat on her desk before looking from Chuck to Richard. She was nodding gently and had a distant look in her eyes. You both know Justine fairly well, is that correct? Chuck stepped back to the conference table, turning quickly to hide his reddening face. Had Lorraine seen the kiss? I'm not exactly sure what you mean, Richard said. Lorraine smiled warmly. Everything about her was warm. You work across from her. You spend all day together. You? Lorraine nodded at Chuck. I see you up here a lot which suggests a familiarity with both Richard and Justine, so tell me about her. Richard and Chuck exchanged another quick glance. Chuck was definitely concerned about what Lorraine had seen. The kiss, the grinding, or nothing at all? 
for Richard, the out-of-character, monster-cock-inspired sexual dalliance was barely a footnote to the dozens of anxiety-inducing thoughts racing through his head. If Lorraine had her sights set on Dorian King's job, was she scouting Justine, who was already at the height of her administrative career, as Lorraine's new executive assistant? Was Justine the hot new model, complete with a powerful sense of confidence thanks to Richard's own penis? And Richard was now little more than last week's stale, smelly leftovers? Did Lorraine Dillon somehow know his dick had fallen off, and now, after all these years working together, he wasn't useful to her anymore? Was Richard about to lose his job just as swiftly as the manager position had sailed right by him? Worse still, the tingle in Richard's dickless crotch was getting more uncomfortable. There's another pickup truck, Dorian King said softly, staring down at the rally. In the last seven minutes, 42 vehicles have arrived. Brad blinked. You've been counting? What kind of message is this sending? Brad was getting frustrated. Was this nut job planning to interview him for the director job, or was he going to keep jerking his useless balls off to the rally downstairs? Brad looked at Justine, but she seemed to enjoy the CEO's preoccupation. Brad quickly calculated that if the job interview was now for a director-level position, maybe Dorian King was testing him. Best to play ball, land the job, and then find a way to screw over King Eunuch when there were fewer stakes in play. Brad cleared his throat. Well, sir, if I can be blunt... The message is that Nicholas Green is a close friend, both to you and Vector Defense. And since Green is clearly on a path to the White House, the message continues to be that Dorian King is committed to doing whatever it takes to ensure a long-term, profitable relationship with the government. Considering Green's stance on a state militia and states' rights to defend themselves, this places Vector Defense in an ideal position to ensure an equal relationship with every state government inside the Union. The message, sir, with all due respect, is that we're here to fucking win. When Dorian King didn't so much as flinch at Brad dropping the F-bomb, Brad felt confident he was pretty close to the mark, if he hadn't hit it dead on. Bolstered by King's non-response, Brad chose to press forward. This might be the only shot he would ever have to prove he deserved the director job. And if I might add, Mr. King, Brad said, leaning forward, I have personally been leading the testing on the exoskeleton prototype. Our engineers were reluctant to add munitions to the design, but I convinced them to add shoulder-mounted missile launchers. Every state law enforcement agency, every SWAT, every local police department, everyone will want one of these suits. Just the idea of a real-world Iron Man suit is going to be a huge deterrent for law enforcement across the country. And can you even imagine exoskeleton-equipped task forces shutting down those Antifa protests? I'm telling you, we are developing next-generation crowd control and deterrence with this Iron Man suit. Brad trailed off as Dorian King began to turn away from the window. His face was blank and uninterested, as if he hadn't heard a word Brad said. Nicholas Green's campaign bus just arrived, Dorian said, talking to Justine. I would assume Nicholas is on the bus. Justine let out a strained breath through her nose. Brad put his hands up, confused. I I'm sorry, but what are you even... I want to talk to Nicholas, Dorian King said with a nod. Justine stood up. I'll get it set up, sir. Maybe he didn't get the letter. It's a possibility, but... 
Dorian nodded. But perhaps he ignored it. Just the same, I don't want him to think it was anything personal. Let's do a face-to-face. -face. Dorian considered something, his face a perpetual blank slate. Finally, he said, I'll go to him. And just to be clear, I can tell him this is regarding the letter and the cancellation of the rally? Dorian King turned back to the window, hands clasped behind his back. Correct. Brad couldn't believe what he was hearing. Y you're canceling the rally? Dorian King's head twitched. He glanced over his shoulder at Brad, surprised he was still there. Oh, you, he said slowly. We're done here. Go now. Lorraine Dillon kept asking Richard and Chuck questions about Justine. She wanted to know about her background, how decisive she was, and if people respected her, both inside the Vector Defense campus and outside. Chuck did his best to answer, growing more uncomfortable with each probing question. Richard couldn't even hear the questions. It was all just white noise. The buzzing in his ears was too loud. The tingle in his crotch was so bad that he struggled not to squirm. His gaze wandered across those wall-sized bookshelves, eventually landing on the display case of career awards and achievements. Glass sculptures of all shapes and colors lined the shelves, and the message was clear. Everywhere Lorraine Dillon went, she succeeded brilliantly. Inexplicably, Richard's eyes were drawn to the middle shelf at the center of the display case. Surrounded by awards etched with Lorraine's name and prior organizations, a long chef's knife was mounted at an angle by two prongs. The way the knife was placed in the display case suggested something intimately important, but there was no placard or explanation describing its significance. It looked like an ordinary kitchen knife. In fact, the only descriptor Richard could spot was a brand name stamped into the blade. Ginsu.